All right, you guys, let's get started. So today we're going to talk a lot about transportation network planning. I'm so glad that Stuart started because he covered the hard part. And then when we had our numbers guy, he was really covering the other hard part. So today I'm going to talk to you more about how to actually get your people from here to there. And um, as we talk through this um, idea of getting your people from here to there, it's not just getting your people from here to there physically, but also how to get people to think about long range transportation planning um, and thinking into the future and how that network comes together over time. So we're gonna do a couple of things. Um, the way that we're set up with this chat, I just wanna know a little bit about you guys. So we're gonna start with that. First of all, I'll let you know about me and why you know I'm even here. So I've got a formal education in um, English and in pure sciences and also in fine arts and music. And then I went on to get a bachelor's and a master's degree in civil engineering. And I kind of took a little wander around the department next door to us, which was the planning department. And I took some courses in regional planning and, and then I wandered another little department down and I started taking um, courses in organizational behavior and um, organiza organizational development and, um, and, and people behavior. And I sort of ended up into this place where I was working construction materials testing during the summer and um, and going to school. And then I ended up being a transportation roadway designer and a bridge approach designer. Um, I took a little hop up to Alaska for about seven or eight years and I was an MPO planner there. I worked for um, different engineering groups as communications leads and in public participation, a lot of public relations. I became a county plan planner and eventually became what was called the chief of planning. It's, it's a deputy director position in an area that's about the size of a third of uh, um, North Dakota and about a tenth of the people of the whole state. So um, the, the jurisdiction I had was the size of West Virginia, if you think of us in, in, in a state, and it was called the Matanuska Susitna Borough. And um, now I'm, I, I hopped back down. I live in Florida now. And um, I've been a planning consulting leading uh, MPO, uh, which is Metropolitan Planning Organization, planning consulting for the state of Florida with HDR. And, um, but recently, about three months ago, I took a position with HDR in learning and organizational development. So it all came pretty full cycle. Um, and I grew up in the Southeast United States over in North Carolina. So you're gonna see my, my happy wolf pack and my 49ers from UNC Charlotte where I got my formal education. So now it's your turn. I want to know a little bit about you. Um, if you have a minute, just pop in your role, your name if you want to, but more of your role, what you do, you know, what you do at your organization and what's that organization. It can be as simple as, you know, I'm a, I'm a public works director and I'm at a municipality. It doesn't have to be real detailed. And then what I really want to know is what's your favorite road to drive or bike or walk or bike on? And, and maybe why you chose that. Just to get you familiar with that chat feature, we're gonna be using it throughout this presentation just to get some questions going and, and see what's happening. So just for an example, I'm performance consultant at HDR, and my favorite road is this road you see on the right. This is the Blue Ridge Parkway that winds through um, up along the Appalachian Range in, uh, in western, western North Carolina. This is what I grew up with, so moving to Alaska wasn't that strange. It was just a little bit colder, a little bit longer. So one of the things that we want, I want to talk about today is, you know, Stuart talked a lot about the actual details of network planning and, and long range transportation planning. And, but the big question is, why do we even bother? One of the things he mentioned was, you know, there's regulations in, in the North Dakota Century Code, you've got to do planning and transportation is one of those things that, um, that is, is required of the state. And that's why you have that state LRTP. And then there's also, FHWO and FDA rules, so that's the Federal Highway Administration, they've got regulations for metropolitan planning organizations, for departments of transportation at the state level. And then sometimes the state delegates um, planning, rate, planning authorities down to, um, to the local level, so counties or um, even down to cities. So those types of things are regulations that are coming from all over the place. And we're gonna talk a bit about the history and like why that happened. Um, there's economic benefits to planning for the future. It gives you a stability for network users. That was talked a lot about with our numbers guy when he was talking about um, uh, the, 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 the Prairie Dog um, funding project. And then 
think about your engaged citizens. There's a really cute example up here. These are actually my niece and nephew. They, um, there are engaged citizens in the next 20 years. They'll be decision makers. They'll be our voters. They'll be our folks. And when we think about the next 20 years, remember what was happening 20 years ago. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. So this guiding transportation network policies are all connected to funding and I'm talking about that a lot today. And so network planning has evolved over time and it, and it helps to move today's economy with today's technology. Um, network planning continues to solve problems as they pop up and that's going to have to happen as quickly as our technology changes. So we keep planning and adjusting to help that next generation. These little guys in the backseat, they're using the transportation system not only to move themselves, but they've got a little freight there in the middle with them. And we want to keep helping move those generations to get to their jobs, their families, their friends, their homes and other joys in life. It's that quality of life that um, the director was talking about at the beginning of today. That's really what's pushing us to plan for the future. So take a look at these guys. They are our future decision makers. So let's talk about what is transportation network planning? Where did it come from? So this is a map from 1957 in the Eisenhower administration. They were um, starting, they were the ones that put past the big, the big highway bill where we talked about actually funding 44,000 miles of, of highway connected networks throughout the United States. So it's not something that was discovered or even like planned out in the beginning. Um, we're going to look at kind of some things that happened, but in the 1800s, but by the 1900s, we really started to get serious. And that's when we started passing policy and legislation that actually funded um, moving people and goods around. So let's take a road trip, if you will, pun intended, down memory lane. So first of all, think about tw 20 years ago. This was what was happening. We were dealing with the Y2K bug. Um, that was actually the Time Magazine um, uh, cover. This was the first cell phone that I ever had was this Nokia phone. It had that great game Snake on it. The PlayStation 2 had just come out. We sent our first group to the International Space Station. Santana um, was up with Rob Thomas and Smooth was the number two song on the charts. And Faith Hill was uh, singing the national anthem and her song Breathe was number one on the top charts. And that cool cat car up there in the top, that's a 2000 Ford Mustang. And um, I wasn't cool enough to have one, but I, one of my one of my buddies had one and uh, that poor little car, it, it really had some cool miles on it. So we had a we had a good time and this was 2000. So that was 20 years ago. And what we were worried about was the Y2K bug and the coolest technology out there was a, a Motorola Razor phone, if you can remember that. And just to make sure you don't forget, we had Windows 2000. So that was pretty fun. So this is what we're planning for now. And, and they were trying to plan for today with this technology 20 years ago. So again, I'm so glad Stuart talked about the LRTP. So I'm going to dip back instead of 20 years from now, let's talk about 200 years ago. So in the 1800s, there was um, things like the gold rush. And so what was happening is the gold rush was happening in the mid to late 1800s. But in the beginning of the 1800s, the fur trade, the American fur trade, North American fur trade express route was being developed and that was going from way up in the end of Canada on the east side all, all the way down um, to the other side of, of what's today is, is um, Oregon. It was an express route and they were really excited because they could go 2600 miles in 100 days. They actually had two folks, uh, two groups that would do this 100, this 2600 mile trip and they would they would meet in the in the um, they would cross paths in the in the spring and the summer. So it was it was um, kind of the first express route. But then what happens in 1830 on Christmas Day, pasture rains are opening up in the southeast for the first time because that steam engine starts taking off and then um, 9000 miles of railroad track is laid down. In the 1950s, the federal government catches up and they start issuing land grants for the railroads. And this is the first federal aid for transportation that really starts to set a precedent um, for future federal aid um, legislation and policies. Then we have that California and Yukon gold rush that's happening. 
those are these guys down here that you're seeing um, going up those mountains in the Yukon and in Alaska. You've got the Erie Canal that's happening. And people are still being pulled by a horse and buggy, but they're starting to do this with longer trips and they're starting to put those horse and buggy on railroads. And then eventually what's happening is that they're, the railroads are being taken over by steam engines. Um, in the middle of this, the American Civil War happens and it slows down um, rail building a little bit. But the invention of the modern automobile in Germany by a fellow named Benz, Franz Benz, he, um, he starts that modern automobile and then pretty soon you're going to remember that the Model T comes out as the first mass produced really quote, affordable um, uh, vehicle that Americans can buy here. In 1895, an article comes out called Horse Flesh Versus Steam, and this is known as the time that it's over for horse-drawn and animal-drawn um, uh, modes of transportation. People are switch switching to the steam engines, and those automobiles are starting to come out. In North Dakota, you guys are really busy in the 1800s. You've got Lewis and Clark that spend their winter vacation, as I call it, between 1804 and 1805, and um, in Fort Mandan, and they meet Sacagawea there, which is a big part of their discoveries. Um, you become Missouri Territory status in 1818, and then by the time you get to 1861, you're into Dakota Territories, and then you're um, getting homesteading steading out there. Bismarck is named the capital of the territory, and of course your statehood happens in 1889. So in the 1900s, things start to really heat up, and this has a lot to do was President Eisenhower way before he's President Eisenhower. When he's Lieutenant Colonel Eisenhower, he's in the US Army and he volunteers to go out with the first transcontinental motor convoy. And what's interesting is he starts to notice that there's an opportunity to make transportation um, infrastructure more reliable because there's so much trouble that happens along his, his trip. So this, picture up here at the top is actually a model of transportation um, of volumes that are happening in the 1930s. And, and this, is, this was in 1939. So there's a couple of Federal Highway Acts that start funding transportation, um, start helping. And one of the first things they started to do were fund local transportation. But it was kind of difficult to figure out how it was being paid for and if folks were getting the job done. And so the Miller Act started making that a little bit more um, standardized. And so that is really the catalyst for what happened. World War II slows down um, highway construction and the idea of highway construction for to, to start doing more local road construction with those dollars to help boost jobs in the market during the war. And then after the war, Eisenhower is in the administration and he is ready to really get going. And by 1956, it's the big federal aid highway act. And that's the one that everyone knows as how the interstate system was funded in, in um, the United States. And then after 1956, you see this just onslaught of um, legislation, just about every um, president from there on out in administration they're in there trying to pay for that service transportation um, act. And then, and the thing that it, today, even today, we are on a one year extension with our current administration for the FAST Act as it was passed in 2015. All right, so that's a lot of history. And what I wanna talk a little bit more about is a case study on, okay, here's where we've been. So, so how do you take what we've been doing in these past 200 years and start doing them today? Well, uh, Sir so talked about the long range transportation plan that North, North Dakota is doing. I want to talk about a long range transportation plan that was happening, um, you know, in Alaska a few years ago. And it was in a region that's about the third of the size of your state. So, and, and about, um, about a tenth of the population. So there's about a, uh, 80,000 folks that, that were living in this area. But in the greater region, it's more than half of the state's population and the state's population is similar um, to North Dakota's and so it was about 350 to 400,000 folks that live in central in the central region of Alaska and this is what was going on. So the success story is that I was working together with 
with the people there. And, and the people that I was working with are four municipalities, the borough, which is a lot like a county. It runs like a county, but it's just big. As, like I said, the size of West Virginia. Within our county, we had three cities, Houston, Wasilla, and Palmer. They were all three different types of cities. One was a first class city, one was a home rule, and one was a second class city. Then I had the Alaska Department of Transportation Public Facilities, who are big stakeholders uh, because they own so much of the transportation facility, but the, but the borough also owned transportation facilities, and so did Wasilla and Palmer. Then finally, our neighbor metropolitan planning organization that covered all of Anchorage and then some and came right up to our border, our jurisdictional border, was the Anchorage uh, Metropolitan Area Transportation System, AMAT. And then we had some other partnerships that were a little surprising through AARP. So what we did is we got out and we talked to people during that long range transportation plan, which looked a lot like um, what North Dakota is doing now at the state level, only it was localized to this area in, in, um, in, Mat in the Matsu borough and in central Alaska. But we went out and we, we wanted to talk to people where they were. Um, we wanted to go and meet the community and find commonalities in our communities and not focus on so much how we were different, but how we were similar and what our similar goals were. And that started with just big conversations. Um, we would have this partner with AARP that just hopped out of kind of nowhere. Um, the president of AARP was was my, she, she lived down the street from, from the borough building where I work. And she showed up a lot to the meetings and she figured out I was the planning chief and she said, do you know anything about how to make a community livable, how to increase the quality of life in our communities. And I was like, boy, I've been waiting my whole career for somebody to ask me this. And, um, and I said, sure. And ARP had started to do this thing where they wanted to talk about um, preparing communities for any age, age eight to 80 is kind of what they talk about. But whether you're a little kid or you're 85 years old, they wanted folks to be able to get around in their cities. And those are, those are um, commonalities that we all have. So it was incredible to have this partner and they just wanted to push our communities to make them stronger and get through those walls that are awful difficult for agencies to agencies to break down for whatever reason. Um, and they were really excited. And so their volunteers and their staff began to ask questions of our agency staff and other neighboring agency staffs. And they just wanted to talk about it. And I was this point person who was in charge of talking to the Alaska DOT for the Matsu borough. And so what we started to do was partner with the other agencies, with DOT and with our cities, and we would have public discussions like these you see in this picture. We were on the radio with Talk of Alaska, which is kind of a, a, a daytime commute um, show where they interview different folks on what they do in Alaska. And I sat there with the director of DOT in, in Central Region, and we just chatted about what was going on in Alaska. We used story maps, which I'm gonna show you in a second. Um, interactive online maps and comments, a lot like what North Dakota DOT was doing. And we did traditional public meetings. Sometimes those, you know, and, and at that time we were still meeting face to face. Those were really, really helpful um, for people to just come out and shake hands and get to know who, um, who they were and who their neighbors were and what was important. We also started agency to agency information sharing. And that was what I was in charge of. I, I went to the other agency planners, the other, directors and chiefs of planning and I said, look, we really need to share our information. We need to share our data. And I found out who our point people were at every place. So this is one thing that you could do as a local government is figure out who your point person is. This doesn't have to be a new position. My position was not new. And I carried this point person position from being a planner into being a deputy director. Um, the skills that I look for when I replace myself is I look for somebody that saw the big picture, that they were an active listener, they were diplomatic and dynamic, and that they were sort of an organizational structural nerd, so they knew how the organizations were set up and how to move comfortably within the organization. So I also needed them to understand some basic mechanics like traffic models. I needed them to know what they were and how they were used, which is not the same as being a traffic modeler. It's just understanding how that data is used. And then I also wanted them to know basic things like what is functional classification of roadways and about local and state design guidance. What are we working with? What are our design guides? And what are our boundaries? I also wanted them comfortable with legislation and policy so that they knew um, about FHWA and FTA guidance so that they could keep us on course 
We also have a good grasp of what those um, Code of Federal Regulations said for transportation planning so that we were uh, fulfilling our obligations so that we'd be eligible for funding and then what's required, what's encouraged, what's best practices, and what is none of those things. So what they did is they implemented action plans that were already there. And this is something I really encourage uh, local municipalities and counties to do is to go out there and figure out what those action plans are and know your stuff. The point person was kind of that person that knew these things in a nutshell. They didn't come on board. And when I did replace myself, I didn't hire somebody that already knew these things. I hired somebody that had the ability to get to know these things because it's different everywhere. As a planner, every time you pick somebody up and I picked up um, someone out of New York, um, upstate New York, they came out and they came to work in Alaska. They didn't know anything about Alaska. And we've got some funny state laws there. So I had to help teach them where to get this information, but they got to know it and they got to know it quickly. The other big thing was they facilitated tough conversations and that's where that diplomacy comes in. You've really got to be a team player and know how to chat with people and have those hard conversations. It also provides that point of contact for the other agencies where communication is key. Okay, so we've I've talked a lot about and there's you know all kinds of PowerPoint here, but let me show you an example. And um, I'm hoping that you can see this. Dale, let me know. I'm going to show you an example of what we used. I'm guessing by your silence you can't see it. I'm going to try again. Okay, see a picture of you right now. How about this? Okay, so, JS, it looks like it's loading. Yeah. Yes, long range, you're on. Okay, so what happened is we started with these online tools, which I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because you just had Stuart show you something similar. But what we did instead of a, a more interactive tool, like what uh, Stuart's group did with an NDDOT, we had the long range transportation plan do an overview in what's called a story map. This is still connected to GIS, <coughs> excuse me. And um, we basically walked through what was in the LRTP because um, the LRTP is a policy document just like your LRTP is at the state level at NDDOT. And I wanted people to read it, but there's a lot of stuff in there. So we made some things easy to look at. We do have a lot of text in here, but it's a lot less text than the 120 page document that we ended up with. We told them about legal requirements and why things are necessary. One of the coolest things over here though, is we started talking about population and what it looks like in the future. And we really wanted to talk about why these things were helpful. At the same time as this is starting to be um, adopted, what is happening is our capital projects department is realizing they don't have enough money to, to fund the system, which is constantly a problem, especially in places like North Dakota and Alaska, where you have a, a big area <coughs> and a small population. So those things like gas tax, it's, it just doesn't work as well um, because you just can't generate it enough because you just don't have as many people moving through as a, a place that's heavily populated like Florida, where there's 26 million people and we have 75 million visitors a year just to the parks and Disney and Universal. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we did is we put together a road bond package, and this was something that was a question earlier about bonding, and we just needed about $50 million, and we thought we would do a 50-50 split. So the cool thing was, is we talked about project benefits, and we did something really simple. We talked about connectivity and congestion relief. And then we said, you know what? We can take an eight mile drive. These are two neighborhoods that are right next to each other and we can turn it in to a much shorter trip. And these were some really simple GIS tools that we used to help show people what, <coughs> what benefits were on the projects in the road bond package. All right, so I've talked a lot about Alaska. One of the things I wanna look at next is I want to share with you guys <clears throat> about actually what's going on in North Dakota. So there's there's some things that everybody asks for. They ask for um, 
What's the situation? What's the benefit? Show me a map. Tell me about the projects. Did you talk to the public? What's this going to cost me, right? And so in North Dakota, I just pulled up another, <clears throat> I made a little map for you. So this is, this is information that's all publicly available with North Dakota. And what I pulled up is who your planning people are. So you've got all of these cool, you guys have regional councils, which is really cool. And these boundaries um, are things that are, as you can see, they're just kind of laid out, but probably going around counties, um, county lines, if you look at these, and you guys know your backyard way better than I do, but they're probably not regionally drawn out based on um, things that make sense from a transportation network system. It probably makes sense in some sort of a <clears throat> local jurisdiction place. So let's just let's just go in here in Lewis and Clark Regional Development Council and this is where your Bismarck Mandan MPO is. So what I did is I just laid like I said <clears throat> information that's already there and I started pulling in your county roads, your state owns, your nat roads, your national highway system roads. This is starting to show you how your state is planned out and how your network is already developed. <coughs> and for the most part, your network is probably not going to change a whole lot. You've got your major arterials. Now we're in this process of having to improve what we already have and take care of it. And that's what a lot of funding is going to these days is just maintaining what's going on. <clears throat> now that may be different in North, North Dakota, um, but you do have your major arterials. And so what usually is going on, you've got a lot of your budget going to maintenance um, and um, every year maintenance like snow removal and ice and ice um, removal and, and mitigation. And then also you just have to get out there and replace that concrete. And you guys know being in a cold uh, a concrete or asphalt usually is what's going on in colder environments. In Alaska, <clears throat> our, you were so you were able to put studs on your tires and those studs would wear out that asphalt every year and just create these these grooves in our main highway system and they weren't the size of a tractor trailer they were size of a passenger vehicle so that's what was pulling up our asphalt every year and it was happening we had a really short asphalt life up there <coughs> one of the things i really liked about what's going on in, in south dakota is you guys actually have and this is a public public information you guys have all of your snowmobile um, trails mapped out and so this was super fun so up here in uh, your source basin and i'm sorry if i'm saying that wrong the basin planning council look at this cool snowmobile i mean that's just some of the really neat things that you guys have going on up there so you know, i'm getting a, a note that says that my call quality is poor so i just wanted to make sure that you um, can still hear me I, I can hear you, Jess. Sometimes when you're putting your head sideways, I lost you for a bit, but All right. I can hear you. Okay. Well, let's go on back in here and maybe that'll help out our um, connectivity a little bit. Okay. So what's going on in North Dakota is you all are following the plan that was laid out in the 1800s with, the, with looking at everything that the Lewis and Clark expedition was looking at then by the 1930s. Here's that cool picture of where those connection points were going to be made between big population centers. You guys are still up here right in the middle working out, right? And then by 1957, here's that original map I showed you where Eisenhower was continuing to develop um, and, and future administrations continuing to develop the uh, interstate highway system. And then this is today. And look at that from the 30s to today and even in these these um, initial exploration, it was all there. So you guys are doing a great job. You're already doing regional coordination. Um, the North Dakota DOT statewide LRTP update is in the middle of, of happening. Um, you've got regional councils and MPOs, as I showed you on that map. And, um, and these are your, your, your big MPOs. Talk to those folks. They really know what's going on. They, they in, a, in a large sense of the word, because they are your urban centers, and um, <clears throat> in the middle of the 1900s, that's when America, uh, it, it happened that more than 50% of, of the American population were living in urban areas. And that just continues to be the trend. Um, even though there are a lot of rural areas in, um, 
North Dakota and kind of the Mountain West, you've got to remember where your people are living um, and and where those those kind of big decisions are are happening and how that that those decisions impact the rest of the rural areas in particular. And then there's that technical coordination, that open source GIS data and the agency peer-to-peer -peer information change like I was talking about it. So there are some opportunities that you guys have um, for making plans happen from a local government perspective. So the first thing is just knowing your planning people. And this is where your planners have a little leg up on um, sometimes on the decision makers. They know who is writing the plans and they know who's um, who's involved with the decision making. Sometimes those decision making are elected officials and and it's a planning process that's very clear and sometimes planning decisions are being made because the states and the local um, uh, local jurisdictions have authorities to make these decisions and they're being made and it's not quite clear everything that led up to those decisions. So know your planning people and they can really help you get to know what's going on from a technical standpoint. Um, and from a, a policy standpoint. Also, have some have some confidence in yourself. Know that you're the expert in your backyard, and so is the person that lives in the in the backyard next to you, right? And what I mean by that is the next region over. So try to be patient with them and understand that that they know their their backyard just like you know yours, but they also know how it is to be your neighbor. So have those conversations and understand that you are this expert and you guys have this in common. So also learn what's already been done. This kind of goes back to knowing your planning people. But do your research, do your homework. And um, we live in this fabulous time 20 years out from 2000 where um, everything is online, everything is available publicly, um, and you can see what's going on in your area. One thing you can do from a policy standpoint is to review those re regional boundaries whether they're a regional planning council or the MPOs. Every 10 years with the US Census, MPOs review the regional boundaries. Now, um, what's interesting is that's gonna happen next year for all of you because um, it happens at the bicentennial US Census, which is going on right now. So this is something that you could actually do right now, next year, this is a short-term um, policy decision that you could be involved with. And those regional boundaries are important because like I said, Sometimes with our um, planning council boundaries, we put them based on other jurisdictions and not necessarily what maybe makes sense from a transportation and a land use perspective. And then also manage expectations of your people. It can get really frustrating <clears throat> because of how long we plan out transportation networks. And so just keep your people engaged. And then finally, just keep talking about it. So we don't have time today to go through this tech demo and it doesn't quite work with, with a um, chat session. And I want you all to be able to ask some questions. So I'm gonna slide through this. This was only if we had time. And just ask if you guys have any questions, comments, thoughts, and, and how are we doing on, on time, Dale? We, we do have a few minutes, Jess. And and audience, if you'd use the Q&A section, that would be perfect. And we are getting, Jess and I are seeing your comments and we'll we'll publish some of those. So we do have time. Jess, maybe I can start with one. What opportunities do you think there are for better networking and better network planning? And most importantly, the implementation throughout North Dakota and the North Dakota communities. I think some of the best opportunities you all have is to start working with the the MPOs and the regional councils that are already established. They're going to have staff and they're going to have um, folks on on staff that are those point people. So that's the one thing that you can do. And the other thing you can do is establish your own point person locally. And this could be somebody that you already have on staff. that has a little capacity and I know we're all busy, but it was it's something that you may find someone that is ready to take on a stretch assignment and they can really get out there and help be your eyes and ears and your knowledge for what's going on regionally and how to help make you more efficient and effective as planning is going on in your region. Great question, Dale. Well, thank you. Thank you for the answer. The response was awesome. Uh, what about policy changes? What, 
what policy changes are needed to happen to implement this type of work? It depends on what's go what's going on and what your um, what your goals are as a community, and every community is different. So those policy changes, <clears throat> North Dakota doesn't have policies there. The challenges aren't really any different than anywhere else, even though North Dakota, you guys have some some challenges that are different than, say, Florida, for example. We have sea level rise, but you all are still dealing with um, stormwater issues and infrastructure that could be crumbling because Maybe your pipes were built out of wood in 1800. So th those are things that, that you'll need to deal with um, from a maintenance perspective. So policies that are wrapped around maintenance are always great, but that's true of anywhere, not just North Dakota. And what my message is, is, is continue to talk to people and talk to all of your community members and your stakeholders because it seems simple, but that is the hardest thing to do, but it's the best thing to do for an integrated transportation system over time. Uh, that, that's so impactful. And you started off talking to people and the part that I really liked that you had was where they are. That That's how we really connect, right? That's true. And, and you, so, and right now a lot of us um, are at home, we think, because we're surrounded by people like this. But let me give you a, a kind of a scary number. In Broward County, Florida, that's where Fort Lauderdale is and where some of the hardest hit um, COVID uh, hotspots were in the country. <clears throat> and we have a lot of uh, folks that are, are high risk groups in Florida, um, be that um, kind of older Americans or or, or uh, older po demographics and populations or, or just folks with pre-existing conditions. A lot of people retire down here, right? So in Broward County, um, we had 5% of the workforce was able to take their jobs home. 5%, that was it. Um, we lost 25% of the commuting volume on our roads <clears throat> in the middle of, of, of June. We compared it to the, the same June traffic numbers a year ago. So we saw that drop during um, the COVID pandemic, the, the peak of the cases in uh, Broward County, Florida. And so if only 5% of people were able to take their work home with them, but we had a 20% drop in traffic volume. Some of that's tourism that didn't happen. Some of that is, is um, you know, well, that's pretty much it. Those are our commuter roads. So what is happening is we have the same problem a lot of urban areas have. Um, and you guys have this in North Dakota too as well. It's more expensive to live in urban areas than it is to live in a little further out in a suburban or a rural area. And so a lot of people do what we call drive to qualify, right? They drive far enough to qualify for the, the size house or rental that they can afford. And so those drops in um, commuter traffic or in traffic in general, yes, tourism, but also our commuters that were in service industries that were shut down due to social distancing guidelines and recommendations. So 5%, think about that. That's that's really, really tough. And that impacted um, a, a lot of things going on in our network system. I mean, congestion really looked, you know, not so bad anymore, but folks weren't going to work. So <laughs> it's just some food for thought. We have time for one more question. It, it <laughs> seems like there's a simple, simple solution. That's that's not quite so easy. Deploying the three C's of the planning process, the continuing cooperation and comprehens comprehensiveness. Why isn't it so simple and what are the real boundaries that happen from jurisdiction to jurisdiction? It's not simple because it's hard to talk to people. It takes a lot of time. It's inefficient. It's, um, it's, it, it hurts. Um, we have to lay our biases at the, at the door and we have to decide that we're going to give a little and we're going to gain a little. And it's hard for us to do that when we go in as point people and advocates for our communities because we love our communities and we want what's best for our people. And it's, and it's almost counterintuitive to think that um, a community next door to us is seemingly a headbutting problem can't be solved together and we get stuck. <clears throat> the other problem is, is that sometimes our local officials um, they've got a short time to do their job 
and they want to do a good job, is, has been my experience with locally elected officials. They want to do a good job, but maybe they're only in office for two or three years. And so they're doing their best to make change while they're there because they don't know if they'll be back for another term or maybe there are term limits or something like that. So some of those structural issues um, put pressure on quick turnarounds and, and decisions that maybe aren't thinking about the long term, not because we don't think about the long term when we're in short terms, short term situations as elected officials, but uh, but mostly because we're looking um, to what can we get done today. And so what I watched was a lot of my elected officials take a lot of time trying to get caught up so that they could make good decisions and then they ran out of time to implement decisions. So this is where as your staff and your planners, we have to work hard and work quickly to make it um, easy for you to get the information you need right away and to get in there, get the information you need so that you can you can guide your community for the best um, the best solutions for your community and your neighbors. I think I answered that question, Dale. You, you did very well. Yeah, and I, I look back to your maps. I love the way you presented this. You started back with history and how that planning comes together in different different ways. There's all these jurisdictions. There's a short timeline for our relatively of our elected officials. How do you make those long term decisions and keep that connectivity of a, of a network or grow it or or enhance it? So love it and your drive to qualify. I can tell you that my teammate Tim Horner and I will be having discussions on that. That's one of his favorite topics. So love that too. Director Panos, you popped in. If there's something you'd like to say, please pop back in. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, I'm, I'm good. Let me watch for a little while. Thank you for having me, though.